Now this morning, I'm going to provide us with a little bit of a summary of what we've looked at over the last few weeks, and we'll go through that in our introduction. And after I complete that, we're going to move into this final major section of our discussion, and that is concerning uh, how to maintain marriage, how to continue to strengthen marriage. And we will look at this as our final charge in this series. But before we dive into those four points, I thought it would be helpful for us to have a little bit of a summary to look at where we've been and so that we can capture all of this. And of course, if you've missed any of these talks, uh, they're all available on our website and you can have some of that filled out a little bit with some more information. But let's quickly give the summary of where we've been the last number of weeks. We began by talking about the meaning of marriage. When we talk about the meaning of marriage, we recognize that first of all, marriage comes as a result of a divine blueprint. Marriage wasn't humanity's idea. It's not the result of church tradition. It's not the idea of a council of individuals who got together and say, let's do this and let's make it work. Nor is it something that has simply evolved over the ages. The blueprint of marriage comes by means of divine design and definition. It was God, the creator of heaven and earth, who made marriage. Let us be very clear in our minds. Marriage is God's idea. And therefore, marriage is good. It doesn't matter what a society, an individual, a government, or a church ever says with regards to a redefinition of marriage. Marriage was God's idea, and he is the one who defines what it is. And in understanding the blueprint of marriage, we see very clearly in Genesis 1 and 2, reaffirmed, of course, in the very words of our Lord Jesus in Matthew 19, that marriage is to be understood as a covenant relationship between one man and one woman in permanent union on this side of glory. And this marriage, this blueprint, has blessings. And the blessings are seen in that marriage is given for the purpose of that couple entering into this covenant relationship to enjoy pleasure that is spiritual, social, and sexual, where possible to enjoy the blessing of procreation, to enter into partnership and to be productive together for the glory of God. They are the blessings of marriage. Then we talked about the mystery of marriage and that it was seen specifically in reference to the distinct roles that God builds into this marital union. Male and female are equal in value. Uh, they are both precious in God's sight, can equally be used by God to serve him and to be a blessing to others. But God has made male and female different and we know this is true physiologically, but it is also true in terms of their roles. And in marriage, we learned about the difference between the role of a husband and the role of the wife. But we did learn in that discussion that the differences of those roles when coming together, though there will be challenges due to sin in this world, when this cooperation occurs in the light of Scripture with sacrifice and consideration toward one another, this marital union provides a great picture, and that is a mystery. It is the picture of Christ and the church. The husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church, and the wife is to submit to her husband as the church submits to Christ and there we learnt about that beautiful picture that when that marriage is on full display, the gospel of Jesus Christ is being promoted in the eyes of those who look on. And we remind ourselves that in this day and age, as this world that we live in, which we could describe as a murky, uh, as a murky muck, it is a dark and decaying world, a marriage like that stands out and therefore becomes an amazing platform for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We then moved from the roles in marriage to a discussion relating to communication in marriage. 
We reminded ourselves that communication is also a gift from God because God communicates. He is the greatest communicator of all. And we, as human beings, have the privilege to communicate with one another. We do it in all of our relationships. There is verbal and nonverbal communication. But we also learned that communication is the very thing that will often bring about much controversy and conflict. So it's important that we have a biblical understanding of communication. And in talking about that, we discussed the importance of godly communication being characterized by humility, being characterized by honesty, and finally being characterized by holiness. And when we allow those principles to drive the way we communicate with others, we are going to have Christ-exalting communication that will build up the other individual. But of course, uh, we are sinners, and as sinners, uh, we won't always cooperate. Sometimes we may say the right thing, but deliver it the wrong way, or a person might not receive the communication being issued to them. So therefore, we had to deal with the topic of conflict. And in discussing conflict, we talked about the uh, road or pathway to peace using the acronym P-E-A-C-E, -E, and P stood for pleasing God, E stood for examining self, A stood for asking God for wisdom, C stood for confronting the individual gently, and E stood for endeavoring to make sure we maintain the bond of peace. So that was our discussion there, and I did fail to mention one of our studies, um, we're not in the right order now, but we did talk about the attacks on marriage as well. Attacks that can come before a couple is married, attacks that come from within a marriage, and attacks that can be uh, both as well. And we needed to be mindful that if marriage is the greatest earthly illustration of Christ and the church, then we need to understand that it's going to be the relationship under the most attack in this world. So I've just given you a brief overview. You're probably thinking, why couldn't we just do those five weeks in five minutes like that? But it's because there was a lot more to say, as you know. So that was a brief overview of where we've been. Let's now go to where we're going to close with our discussions. What I want to talk about today is some practical principles relating to how to strengthen marriage, how to maintain marriage. And I want you to note that the first point we're going to look at is the most important point. You get this first point wrong, then everything else will crumble. In fact, the first point I'm going to share with you is the first point that relates to all relationships that we're in. It relates to everything that we do. The first point is if we're going to maintain marriage, we need to pursue God. We need to pursue God. Let me read to you Psalm 42 verses 1 and 2. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God. I want you to see in those first two verses a longing of this believer. The believer here longs for God. This individual knows that there is only one who can satisfy his longings. Now, every one of us has longings, we all have desires. And God has made us as human beings with this capacity for desire. But the problem that we have is we battle with sin, and sin distorts our desires. And we are all searching for something to satisfy us. In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 3 tells us that God has written eternity on our hearts. So as human beings, we actually crave for something big. We long for something huge. And the problem that we often have is we look at the wrong place for that satisfaction. 
Now, I could spend a long time listing hundreds and thousands of things that people try to be satisfied by, but I think you can classify them into categories. People will try to seek to be satisfied by possessions. If I just have the right amount of dollars or the right amount of uh, objects, I will be happy. So some people try to get their happiness in possessions. Some people try to get their happiness in prominence. If I just have the right level of power, the right job description, the, the right job title, and that I'll be happy. And then others uh, try to get it in uh, personal pleasure, uh, whether that be seen in, in, a, in relationships or whether it be seen in other fields along those lines. People try to seek out their satisfaction in those things. But if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, and you know from your own experience, the book of Ecclesiastes makes it clear that I've searched all these things out, says the preacher, and in the end it is all vanity. Uh, you will not find your ultimate happiness in the passing pleasures of this world. But the psalmist in Psalm 42 looks past those things and says, I want to be satisfied, but I want my satisfaction to be met in you, O God. I crave for you. And it's important to know this because only God can satisfy our desires. Only God can satisfy us because only God is God. Only God is so big, so great, and so glorious. There is none like him. And we need to be reconciled with him. We need to receive forgiveness from him. We need to be adopted into his family, and we need to pursue him all of our days. Let us be reminded that in any relationship, the most important relationship is this, your relationship with God. If we are not pursuing God, marriage cannot be a blessed union. If we are not pursuing God, our friendships will not go well. We need to pursue God. Let me give you another reference. Go over to Psalm 84. I love this psalm. This psalm is all about longing to be with God. How lovely, it says in verse 1, is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. There again you see the longing of this believer to meet with God, to worship God. And I want you to note also verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So if we're going to maintain marriage, first of all, we need to make it our commitment to be pursuing God. And I'm sure we could all agree when we look at any situation honestly, when there is a breakdown in a relationship and we ask ourselves the question, how much have I been pursuing God in the process? We can always see that we need to improve in this area. Not to say that every breakdown of a relationship will always be because you're personally not pursuing God. Yes, it's true. There may be faults in another individual, but I don't think any of us could ever tick this box perfectly. And therefore, it is to be our constant pursuit. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That is our chief pursuit. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whether you're having breakfast, lunch or dinner, whether you're having a coffee, having water, having orange juice, do all to the glory of God. That is our chief pursuit. And when this happens, when a husband and wife come to the conviction that that is what they both must be doing, the two, by definition, will grow closer together. So that is why this is the first and most important practical point when it comes to maintaining marriage. When a husband and wife 
both keep their eyes on the Lord, the two will grow closer and stronger together. I remember when I had met with a, a theologian who was visiting from the US and I had the opportunity for him to uh, meet with Di and I. Now, Di and I weren't even engaged at this point. It's another story if you talk to Di why I arranged this meeting with this theologian and the two of us. But nonetheless, um, in God's providence, it was a good meeting. Um, in the end, he simplified marriage down to one simple point. And apparently he was renowned for um, having the briefest premarital session. He said it simply this, you want a successful marriage? Andrew, pursue Christ. Diane, pursue Christ. Now I understand that there's much to fill out there and we've been talking about the other things, but you get the point, don't you? Because if you are both pursuing the Lord, the two of you will grow closer together. But if there is a spouse that doesn't know the Lord, obviously there'll be an increased challenge, but the responsibility will always be the same. So that's our first point. We now come to our second point, and that is this. If a marriage is going to be maintained, we must not only pursue God, but secondly, there must be the commitment to prizing your spouse. Prizing your spouse or esteeming, valuing, greatly respecting your spouse. Let me read to you a couple of verses from Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 has that great description of the virtuous woman. But I want you to observe a couple of things that we see in this. We see a, a mutual prizing going on. I want you to see in verse 28, first of all, we read concerning this woman, her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. He praises her. And go to verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when she sits among the elders of the land. What's going on there? You have this mutual commitment in which both the husband and the wife respect each other. And not only do they respect each other, they let others know about it. That is very important. How many times you will hear people in conversation, even in, in discussions that might be classed as somewhat humorous, where they're putting down their spouse. They begin to issue jokes of mockery that can be quite harsh and inappropriate. Here we see in Proverbs 31 a different operation going on here. Here we see a prizing. And it is to be the commitment of husbands to make sure that they are praising their wives. That will involve consideration and thought. That will involve time of actually observing what they do and letting your wives know specifically that this is what I value in you. This is what I see you do. This is something about you as a person that I find precious. You have done this, and it may be an unnoticed act by others, but I saw it, and I need you to know that that is a blessing to this family. These points of praise need to be see, seen in, in things that relate to her as a, as a person. They need to be seen in relation to her actions that impact others. And they need to be seen in things that may almost appear to be anonymous. There needs to be this perception and observation from a husband that he notices his wife and he praises her. But the same thing is to be seen in reference to the wife toward her husband. And it's interesting, the, the dynamics here. Now, I know that there are exceptions to this, and we, can, we all have different personalities, but isn't it fascinating that the wife in Proverbs 31 is praising her husband publicly, where the husband is praising his wife more privately? And in general, uh, there is something about a man being respected. 
are being valued and for others to know about it. Not in the sense of just this open bragging session, but there is just something built into him intrinsically that he resonates with that. But there's something about a very personal, caring, deliberate, focused compliment that would be very endearing to a woman in general. Now, I know that there are crossovers in that. I know that there are differences in personality, but it's just fascinating that you see this dynamic. And all of that to say is, when it comes to prizing, we're all going to be different. Every man, every woman will be different. But the point would be this, know your spouse so well that you are able to praise them in the greatest way. Some people do like to hear it verbally. Some people like to see that praise shown to them and demonstrated by actions. However it is done, we are to genuinely prize our spouses. So if marriage is going to be maintained and strengthened, number one, we need to be committed to the task that we are to pursue God in our relationship so that the husband and wife grow closer together in the process. Secondly, we need to be committed to the task of prizing one another. And that is a precious blessing. Number three, we need to be committed to praying for your spouse. Praying for your spouse. When we take time to pray for one another, this gives us an opportunity to remind ourselves of our relationship with God but it also gives us the opportunity to bring this individual's needs before the Lord. Because we can be so busy in each other's lives, it's very easy to all of a sudden lose sight of praying for those who are closest to you. Uh, we can be very task-oriented sometimes, and we can be caught up with so many other things, and we can be more reactionary and tend to pray very specifically for a, a need that we hear. Perhaps a crisis occurs outside of our families, and we're praying, and that's a good thing. But one thing we must never neglect and strive to be committed to is personally praying for your spouse. What do you pray for? Well, you can begin by thanking God for them. There is much to thank God for. And as you take time to do that, that process of coming before God and actually thanking him for specific things that's in the life of your spouse actually helps renew a deeper appreciation that will actually feed your prizing of that individual. You notice sometimes when circumstances are a bit tough, uh, things are going bad, and we might be struggling in whatever it is, whether it be at work or whatever, but when we actually take time to think about all the good things God has given us, isn't that amazing how that can strengthen us to deal with difficulties? And it's important that we do this. If somebody is having struggles in their relationship, pray about it. Pray for your spouse. Of course, pray for yourself in this. And I would also add, if your spouse is a believer, pray with your spouse, but do both. Take time personally to pray for your spouse, but pray with each other. Because in the process of praying with each other, you will be helping each other pursue God. And there will be a great unity that will be enjoyed. But also praying for each other shows a great love. So take time to thank God for various things. Take time to bring the personal needs of your spouse before the Lord. Take time to pray that your spouse would grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Pray that your spouse would be um, supported and encouraged more by you and that God would give you a sensitivity to see how you can be more helpful, encouraging to um, one another in the marriage. So we need to take time to pray. And I want you to notice something very important, that if we are not taking care of these things, number one and two, if we are not striving to be the people we ought to be in our marriage, this will actually affect our prayer life. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. After a discussion in the first six verses about the role of a wife, Peter says simply in verse 7, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. 
If we are not dealing with these things, that is going to affect our prayer life. So we need to be very mindful of that. And I want to give us our final point this morning, and that is persevere. with your spouse. Persevere with your spouse. We did learn that one of the attacks on marriage in our early discussion was divorce. But before we would even talk about divorce, we need to talk about perseverance. I think we are living in a time that is being championed and promoted and fueled by much of discussion when it comes to high-profile celebrity relationships and also the narratives built into sitcoms and movies, and that is marriage can be left quite quickly and easily without much trouble at all. Uh, there is actually a very little promotion of the idea of persevering. In fact, it's almost assumed that if things aren't just working out, if things aren't compatible, then move on. And, and all of a sudden, it cheapens and damages the marriage relationship. And what that's doing is it's building and feeding an assumption that you can just have what you want the way you like it when you want it. And when you think about it, that's kind of how our world works today. You just look at the rise of technology. Technology is a very useful form of communication. Uh, we're living in an amazing time just from a communication standpoint. There was once a time when uh, there was the first great movement of communication, and that was the building of Roman roads. Uh, all of a sudden, you could quite easily get from one significant city to another significant city. Uh, then there was a time where the second great level of communication occurred in the late 1400s with the invention of the printing press. That information can be distributed in fast form, in, in printed form. But then we have a third major stage of the spread and power of communication with the rise of the internet, which gives us instant communication. And as amazing and as valuable as that third level of communication is, it is also something that can feed into a mentality, and that is instant gratification. If I'm not getting what I want now, I'm out. I'm done. Uh, we're like that with drive throughs uh, We're like that with all sorts of things, because that's just the society we're in. And that's now happening in marriage. If it's not good, just get out of it. Just get into another relationship. And this idea of persevering is removed. Let us be reminded of what it says in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Now, we could go to many places in Scripture that promotes this point, but I want to go to Ephesians 5, and I want you to look with me, uh, beginning in verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But you see the words hold fast, cling to, become inseparable, glue them together, don't let them break apart. That is the idea of those words. Scripture calls for a permanent union. Scripture calls for this marriage to stay together. And though that we could have some discussions relating what Scripture says concerning divorce and remarriage, we need to be clear that it is God's stated will that a marriage is a marriage that ought to be committed to with the, um, the, with the reality of perseverance. We need to make a marriage work. And if there are struggles, and there will be struggles because when two sinful people come together, we're just increasing problems, right? But we know that the relationship is defined and designed by God, and there are blessings that are to be enjoyed in the context of that marriage. And despite the sins, the struggles, the failures of spouses within the marriage and outside of the marriage, there can be a permanence to the union, but there must be a perseverance. 
And that perseverance isn't just a grit your teeth together, close your eyes, and just go hard and just get through it and deal with it. But it will be grit and hard work. It will be a commitment to saying, I must pursue God at all costs. I must be taking time to prize my spouse. I must be praying for them and for me in the midst of any of our struggles. And when difficult times come, I am to persevere. I am not going to get out of this. I am in this. And there is something powerful, particularly when a man makes it clear to his wife that I have a love for you that is a settled love. I'm not going anywhere. Even when we disagree, we can disagree, we can argue, we can get heated in that conversation, but this is not going anywhere outside of this relationship. We are remaining together. There needs to be this commitment to perseverance. So if marriage is going to be strengthened, if it's going to be maintained, I bring forth these four practical points that we need to constantly consider, be reminded of, and be committed to by the grace of God. But I want to remind you in closing that after hearing all of this, the reality is these things simply flow out of this one. So there's only one point. There is one point, and that is pursue God. How did our Lord Jesus say it in John 14 and verse 15? If you love me, said Jesus, keep my commandments. That's what these things are, at least some of them. If we truly love Christ then we will love what Christ loves. And what Christ loves is that a spouse would prize their spouse. Christ would love that we would pray for one another. And Christ loves that we persevere in marriage. So to not sound over simplistic, but to say something that I believe is truly profound, the secret to marriage that all of us, I, you, everyone, needs to know is this, pursue God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and all your strength, and God will bless that relationship. That's what it's all about. We need to pursue God. We need to know him, love him, and follow him. And may he give us the grace and the strength uh, to honor him in that. Well, let me pray, and then um, it would be great to finish with any comments and questions, not just about today, but anything that we've discussed or um, perhaps only lightly touched in some previous weeks. Um, let us pray, and then I'll let you know what's also happening next week. Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to bring to a close formally the studies that we have been looking at in marriage. Uh, as we've acknowledged, marriage is the greatest earthly relationship that pictures the beauty of Christ and the church. So for this reason, we affirm that marriage is precious, but we also recognize with great discernment that that means marriage of all relationships will be the one that comes under the most attack. So help us to be mindful of this, and I pray for every marriage in this congregation that you would protect them and preserve them for your glory and allow them to thrive, displaying the magnificence and beauty of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.